Would you welcome Dr. Lance Wall now as he comes to tell us what God is saying to us. Yes, sir. Well, I love Apostle Tim Sheets. You know, the reason I'm here today is because I just wanted to hang out with him. I was happy to get invited here. I get, I, actually, I make it sound like I got a persecution conference because I'm part Jewish. I'm always acting like I'm persecuted, but uh, I, I, I don't go to many churches. I, I joke about it and say very few have the courage to have you. I just really, it's not that. It's just that I just don't go to many churches because I get exhausted by the end of the week with a media ministry. I'm broadcasting all the time. But, uh, I want, but there's places I do want to go, and this is one of them, because I feel like the Holy Spirit has divine connections that are going to accelerate our access to destiny. And uh, you don't want to have, I mean, I got connections all over the place. I got a Rolodex, it's a golden Rolodex, and I never use it, because unless the Holy Spirit tells me to do something, uh, why do I want to contact Jared Kutchner, for instance, unless I got a reason to contact him? So, um, but I'm supposed to contact this pastor. That's what the Holy Spirit told me. He said, because he's building something in our day that is going to be an apostolic alliance that will form an ecclesia like a key that will go into the clock of God's timing and accelerate what needs to manifest. That's what I was told. The key goes into a clock. The clock now has been running, but it's got to, God controls time. So things got, some things have to catch up. How many of you feel like some things are stalling around here? And it's not your fault. It's that we haven't come to our humble alliance with each other yet. It's an alliance. It's not even a resistance. It's just, in many cases, just ignorance. We don't know what the Father's doing until he shows us. So with that thought, let's accelerate my message. <laughs> Get it out of my mouth now. Put your right hand up in the air. Oh, I got to tell you where this came from first. It's an interesting story. First, I saw this movie Gladiator. It's like over a decade ago. You ever see the movie Gladiator? Well, you really, you shouldn't because it's a very dark movie. It's got lots of violence in it. But I had an editor who was an award-winning editor, edited the movie for me so I could put together my own version of it to do training with. And there's a scene when I was in the theater, I was sitting there thinking, oh man, there's a holy, I can't believe it. I can feel the Holy Ghost in a movie theater. And it was like, I feel this Holy Spirit in like the year 1998, 99 or something like that. But then in this scene, it was where Maximus Desmond Meridius, the commander of the Felix Legions of Rome, he's an underground saint. He's a guy who is, wants to get vengeance against the emperor. He's acting like he's a gladiator. He's really a Roman general and he's keeping his head down. And he hears with 11 other men, that they're in the middle of the arena in Rome, and he thinks he's going to just do gladiator contest stuff and then try to get at that emperor and kill him and avenge himself. But while he's standing there, he realizes, uh-oh, this, this isn't look right. There's 11 of us. Where's, where, who are we fighting? And then he hears this guy say, Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you the recreation of the second fall of mighty Carthage. He's going, uh-oh. And all, it's like this, all the arena, all the balcony, everybody's sitting there, and he, and he goes, and he goes um, there in the barren plains of Sarna stood the barbarian Hannibal with all brute mercenaries bent on death and destruction. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you the barbarian horde. And, he go, and it's them. He goes, uh-oh, we're the barbarian horde, evidently. And uh, he says, I know what's going to happen. Any second now, those gates are going to open up and chariots are going to come out because Hannibal... Is going to uh, is going to be met by um, you know is going to be met by the Romans and the Romans are going to use chariots in order to fight him, and he says, "Have any of you ever worked in the army?" And they go, "Yeah." He says, "You can help me. Whatever comes to those gates, we have a better chance of survival if we work together." Well, actually, he's got this New Zealand accent, which is strange because he's supposed to play um, you know a Spaniard, but he goes, "Whatever comes to those gates, we have a better chance of survival if we work together." And I thought, oh, a good Spanish accent there. And they all go, yeah, yeah. And so he goes, if we stay together, we survive. Boom, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I give you the, you know, the Felix Legions, boom, and the, the doors open up, the chariots open up, and they come swirling around, swirling around, swirling around. And then I, I started listening because every word seemed like a prophetic word. Hollywood every now and then actually has a prophetic moment. And uh, he says, come together come together, and all these independent soldiers who fight on their own, they're going, okay, they're backing up, they're backing up, and they're backing He goes, come together, closer, closer, and as they get closer, he says, lock your shields, and they all lock their shields. Well, you know, in the Bible, the shield is the shield of faith. You have a shield for you, but in a community like this, if the devil attacks the church, you lock your shields around each other, 
and there's more strength and security and divine protection in the body of Christ than being the lone mercenary with a prayer closet. So you got those shields locked, and then the chariot comes rolling towards them like a bowling ball hitting the pins. It comes right at them, and uh, Maximus says, hold, hold, hold. And the moment the collision happens, he cries out, as one. And they yell back, as one. And they all lean into their overlapping shields, the distribution of the point of impact being distributed from one shield to 12 of them. And, and all of them absorb the shock. And the, and the chariot bounces off this uh, formidable wall of steel that was manufactured just out of unity. Now, all over the balconies, people are getting up out of their seats and coming over to the edge and going, ooh, that's interesting. A little remnant overpowering these 12 colossal machines flowing around them because they're moving together in, in, in strategic unity. And so the chariots go back. They're going to go break this thing up. They come back for another, another attack. This time, Maximus says something different. Hold, hold, hold. I'm waiting for as one. And what does he say? Diamond! It's this interesting command. You would miss it if you didn't have the subtitles. So I played it with subtitles. Diamond! Diamond is a different technique. Alexander the Great taught this. This would be where you take your shield, but instead of as one to repulse an attack, you use jujitsu. You literally jujitsu. You literally work with the momentum and roll backwards, lock your shield, and let it become a ramp so that the wheel, instead of breaking you up, goes up the shield. And as that happens, four of you push, and wherever the point of contact is, that shield will flip the chariot. Hold, hold, diamond! Boom, they drop like that, and flip the shield, this whole thing. Now the, the, uh, the, the chariot goes up in the air, and, and Alexander the Great had perfected this with the Greeks. The chariot flies, Maximus says, single column, single column. They break rank and they trap the chariots between them. He gets up on the horse and comes from behind them and starts beheading them in their confusion because they weren't expecting a rear attack by someone that knows how to ride a horse. Now the mob is on their feet cheering, not for the destruction of the barbarian horde, but in celebration of an ingenious demonstration of remnant authority. So, I'm looking at that, and they're yelling, Maximus, Maximus. Now, the name's going through the arena. Who is it? Who is it, Maximus? The guy that actually is trying to be there for revenge now has his name in everyone's mouth. So they, uh, I look up the word diamond, because the Holy Spirit says, there's more in there. I go, well, I got a lot right there. The Lord says, look up diamond. I look up diamond, and I look it up in the Bible, and I find out that the word diamond is embedded in the word that now under principalities and powers shall be put on display the manifold wisdom of God. The word manifold is the many facets of God like a diamond. That means there's a facet of God here in your town or in your state. There's a facet of God in my state. There's a facet of God in whatever the, the circumference of your authority is, wherever the devil is authorized for some weird reason to attack you, you have authority to overturn the outcome and in doing so display the manifold wisdom of God. Does that make sense? So for that reason, would you please stand up on your feet again in the back, you that are sitting down, you see, because the further out you are, the more you can sneak away and sit down. Okay, I want you to all stand up because you want to activate an anointing right now? You want an impartation now? Because I haven't told this story in a long time. But you see, angels like me to tell the story because this is when there's a higher level of, all I can say is, the authority of access through the uh, unity and agreement of the Holy Spirit is about to come upon you. And uh, we're going to put our hand up and we're going to bring it down on the count of three. We're going to say, as one, boom. And I want you to picture whatever barrier is in your life. I don't care from, from cancer to bankruptcy to backslidden family members. Wherever there is a stalled battle, you're going to have that boom, break through it. And you have to see it that way. In the count of three, it's going to be as one. And when I say one, two, three, you're going to go as one. If it was slow motion, it'd be as one. You've got to break that thing. The authority you use at this moment will determine how much voltage goes into you. 
So you're your own voltage regulator. If you're going to go as one, well, you get a little bit. A little fashion anointing, as one. If you want a warrior anointing, as one. And the idea is in a place like this, we want to do the, no, do the Pavarotti as one. Don't go as one. That doesn't work. Go as one. Hear the echo? As one. You want to hear that crisp echo. I don't know why. Angels like the authority of it there. The count of three. Ready for this one? Father, I thank you that there's going to be a multiplying grace and anointing coming into this apostolic hub. Oh, that the voice of this ministry in this house is going to go further, wider, and stronger and higher. It's not the, uh, it's not the time to stop and hold back. It's the time for the multiplication of voice and authority. Oh, for there'll be more shields locking in with this vision in the days to come. There'll be more gladiators coming in from the various north, south, east, and west. Those that hear the sound of the battle will be coming towards this arena. And do not fear the arena. Do not fear the speculation and the gawking and the misunderstanding and the mocking of the media. Oh, the Lord says, because I'm going to get their attention on the battle, and then I'm going to turn their attention to the remnant, and then I'm going to overturn their expectations, and when I do so, I will receive glory. On the count of three, as one. One, two, three. As one! There we go. All right, we're going to do it one more time. I think the ladies sounded a little stronger than the men. Men, you got to pick it up just one a little bit. And I think we had a paparazzi over there. We want a, we want a paparazzi. We want it as one. No sustained soprano notes. Ready? As one. Father, now in Jesus' name, multiply authority and access. One, two, three. As one. There it is. That's the way it ought to be. Have a seat. You could high five or high elbow. I don't know how they high five you. Hey, we had this whiteboard the other day. Do we still have that or do we borrow that from a neighbor? Is that still here? Can somebody find me and fetch me a whiteboard? Like, it's like, you know, the prophet says, fetch me a minstrel. If someone can fetch me a board, just because I get more revelation when I see the board. All right, so here's what I want you to take a look at right now. Well, well the apostle was talking today, I had this uh, idea that uh, we're in unity down in Texas with you. Technology gives us the ability to know each other. So I've been watching what you've been doing and very interested in what you're doing because I, I like you, have been sharing the same battle. Back before anybody was talking about Donald Trump, I got to introduce Donald Trump is a wrecking ball to the spirit of political correctness. And I prophesied that on, uh, accidentally on television when they thought I was Michael Cohen, his lawyer, and they brought me out in front of the camera <laughs> And they said, say something. And they said, this is Michael Cohen, Donald Trump's attorney. And I said, I'm not Michael Cohen. I sound like Jerry Seinfeld. I was all like, I'm not Michael Cohen. They go, well, say something. I said, Donald Trump is a wrecking ball to the spirit of political correctness. Thank you. <laughs> that, was, that was my announcement. That was my first prophecy to the nation. And everyone said, Newsweek, wrecking ball, wrecking ball. Donald Trump's a wrecking ball. And that's when I realized, I realized, oh, look at this. Hallelujah. Thank you. This team, come on now. It doesn't get any better than that. Just asking you shall receive. Look at that. Whiteboard's flying around. Okay, so, so I, I sort of realized that there's a unique uh, kind of anointing God can give you where you start to say something and nobody knows where it came from, but it goes viral. It's like a viral proclamation anointing. And I started reading about the signet ring in the book of uh, Haggai where that signet ring, which is this little ring that you can literally imprint on wax. It's like in Ben-Hur, when they were going to have like a great contest, you'd see the chariot, the Roman guy would take his ring and poof, put it in the wax, pull it out, and that wax seal from the house of whatever would be the seal, like a credit card, guaranteeing the transaction, the integrity of the payment. And the Lord said, there are certain prayers and prophecies and words and things you're gonna do that you must do by faith. And you are my signet ring. You will go ahead and put the stamp of your influence, authority, and name into that which I am doing. And when you pull your hand out into the soft wax of people's impressionable minds and hearts will go the image and imprint of what I am saying. My word will go in. And when you withdraw, my impression will be locked on the inside of them and they'll be wrestling with what I said. I thought, wow, that's wild. But then I realized Charles Finney talked about in his revival campaigns that when he would go out and he would speak, a few words would have the power to bring conviction and conversion. He said it was like arrows in the hearts of the king's enemies. And then he would go out and he said, I noticed that for periods of time I'd be empty and void of this power. 
He called it the Upper Room Pentecost Endowment of Power from on high. And since we're on Pentecost Sunday, I like to expand our definition of it because Pentecostals always think of fire and signs and wonders and, you know, the power and manifestations. But the great power of manifestation on the day of Pentecost wasn't the demons coming out. It wasn't a healing. None of them were being manifested. It was tongues, and it was the utterance of Peter that caused 2,000 people to get saved with about 10 verses. The power of utterance to fix an impression on the hearts and minds of people such that they are literally impaled by God is what Finney said is the evidence of the endowment of power from on high. The power to be able to, within a matter of a few moments, to make an impression from heaven upon earth that shakes up the earth. And it's amplified. He said he'd be void of that power. And he'd have to go for a do- two or three days, no more than three, he said, where he'd fast and pray if necessary, and he would inquire of the Lord as to what he had done, what sin had grieved the spirit. You talk about having having the fear of the Lord and walking with a short leash with heaven. He didn't just go wandering around confessing, I'm accepted by faith and, you know, he didn't do a faith grace confession. He inquired what happened that would cause there to be a diminishing of the power to make an impression upon the minds of people. And he said invariably, after a period of humbling, and, and uh, searching, the Spirit of God would reveal what it was and then it would, re- would return back to him with all of its original dynamic power and vitality. And he said, this has been the experience of my life as an evangelist. Well, I think we all ought to just start. I just want to get a clear starting point and say, Lord, give me that and do it a power so that I'm working with it. And then, then on 24-hour cycles, I'll see if it diminishes or goes away. And I'll go back and see what was I saying, what was I doing, where was I, what was diminishing it? Because I think we do, we do step in and then we step out. Does that make sense? So I think we're in a period of time where God wants to make the church his signet ring. And that's the reason why in the last chapter of Haggai, that great, let's go there if you can right now, I'm I'm apprehended by Haggai. I remember I was with Lou Engel and Dutch Sheets, if this isn't a crazy moment. I'm at, uh, before the election, first election. Lou didn't want to get involved with politics. Dutch, I didn't know where he was going to come from. Jeremiah Johnson was there at the meeting. And I'm there, and it was really weird. I'm at a Focus on the Family building, which makes me feel funny in the first place, because I know Focus on the Family and the Dobsons are evangelical, not chandeliers swinging charismatics. And here, Lou Engel is doing a meeting at a Focus on the Family event. And I can remember, I did not understand what I was speaking at. Because, you know, I'm just building relationships with some of these guys. You can go your whole lifetime, in, you know, in, in, as your own island, or you can start to connect with people. And I remember it was a Daniel 222 conference. And I, I knew it was kind of a catchy idea. But I really didn't understand what Lou was doing. It was like God is, what is, what is, someone find Daniel 222. What is it? It's God has hidden things and he's going to reveal them. Anybody got this verse in their Bible? Anybody bring Bibles to churches anymore? You guys do know what a Bible is? It says in a Koran we're bringing here. You guys got it? What is it? What? God reveals the deep things, right? Deep and secret things. Thank you. So I'm at a God Reveals the Deep and Secret Things event. And I just flew in. All I know is I'm at Focus on the Family, Lou Engel's event. I'm all burdened because Donald Trump is on my brain. It's a signet ring moment. I got to proclaim it, and nobody wants to hear it. At that point, everybody loves Ted Cruz or Mike Huckabee or Ben Carson or Marco Rubio. Nobody wants this heathen from Queens. So I'm going, oh, man. I can't get this guy out of my head. What am I going to do, Lord? I shouldn't even be on the road right now. So I go in the elevator. I get in the elevator, and these, these, uh, you know, our tribe, I got our people out there, our intercessor people. This is Colorado Springs, too, so Peter Wagner and all of our people out there. So they're out there for the Lou Engel prophesy and, you know, intercession event. And uh, they women get in the elevator, and then some lady gets in with her rubber, you know, cap on and a towel wrapped around her swimming suit. She's obviously not going to the meeting. She's going swimming. I get in, and I'm trying to look down, and all these Daniel 222 tags are on. I go, oh, boy, Daniel 222 people are here. I go, what in the world is this conference about, Lord? Where am I going? I just flew in. And as we're going down, like the sixth floor, this lady with the bathing suit on goes, Daniel 222, what's that? 
And they go, ask him, he's the speaker tonight. And I'm like this, I thought I was incognito. And I'm praying in tongues going down there, whoa, Lord, what's Daniel 222, what's that about tonight? And so she goes, oh, really? Well, what, what's Daniel 222 all about? And I go, well, all I know is that, uh, and I can see right away she's not a Christian. I'm talking to our most fanatical wing of the body of Christ, and I'm sitting here figuring out what I'm doing. So somewhere between the fourth floor and the first floor, here's what I came up with. I said, well, we are a gathering of futurists, a unique tribe of people that takes the clues of things that were spoken intuitively about the future, gathering the evidence from things past, linking it into present history, and projecting the highest and best possible outcome for tomorrow, and forming agreement and alliance about the manifestation of those future events. And she goes, well, heck, if I knew that, I wouldn't be going swimming, I'd be going to the 222 thing. Futurists, forming alliances, coming into agreement, interpreting what happened, what's happening, and where it's supposed to go. I love that. Well, <laughs> when I was done, I started thinking about, well, maybe the Holy Spirit put that into my mouth there to explain to me what's happening. We're supposed to be looking at the trend lines of what has happened in the past, try to tie it into what's happening right now and all the chaos, and then project what is God doing in the future. That's what an Issachar tribe does. Issachar is the tribe in the Bible that ties together the disparate and disjointed evidence of what God has said in the past, what's going on politically in the government right now, and where is this supposed to be going in the future, and how to align with the highest and best. So this is on my mind when uh, Lou Engle, who doesn't hardly know me, Brother Lance Wallow, his name's come up, and we've invited him here to talk. He likes a whiteboard, so we're here to hear what he has to say. And there's Dutch walking around kind of pensively in the back, kind of brooding, and... Uh, I'm going, oh, my, my, my. This will be a wild time. So I said, well, I'm just getting this revelation now. I submit it to you. It's, it's fresh, all hot off the press. It could be a mess. But I see where Jeremiah, the prophet, he prophesied. So think about the prophet. He prophesied, and he said that, uh, well, Israel's going to go into captivity. It wasn't a positive prophecy. Seventy years, and he prophesied what was going to come in the future and that God was going to end up sending someone who was going to break that cycle. And uh, Jeremiah was also along with Isaiah, who said there was a Cyrus coming. Jeremiah has 70 years captivity. Isaiah has uh, looked for Cyrus. And lo and behold, Cyrus shows up. So there comes a time when the prophets are prophesying, the intercessors are praying, and then in history God manifests. But Cyrus was a secular figure. He was a little confusing for the Jews. He was an anointed deliverer who came from outside their movement. I said, but after Cyrus comes this moment in Haggai where the prophet Haggai says through Zerubbabel, uh, speaking to Zerubbabel, God wants a house. And that house is the reason why he's raising up that Cyrus. He wants to have a house that is going to be a glorious structure which will be filled with his glory and evidence of his governmental engagement on the earth. And then once the house comes along, there's going to be walls and gates restored because Nehemiah is going to come on the scene. He's going to be working with a guy named Ezra. The two of them are going to see walls and gates restored. When the walls and gates are restored, there's going to be a Jerusalem which Jesus is going to come to. This, to me, is going to be the evidence in the last days of sheep nations and goat nations in their final form, and then the Lord shall return and judge the nations. I said, so if I was looking at this, I'm doing this live and figuring it out while I'm going from my elevator pitch, things past, things present, things future. I said, we've got Chuck Pierce and Dutch Sheets and Cindy Jacobs and all kinds of prophets in the United States of America prophesying about the future, about America. I don't think Hillary Clinton is God's highest and best. I think that takes us over a cliff. I think God's doing a divine intervention. That was what I was throwing myself out there. You could hear all the, I guess the butts in the room clinching. Uh-oh, we're going, we're going political. <laughs> I said, worse yet, Donald Trump answers all of my definitions. He's definitely not one of us. He's an outsider. 
He's coming in from Queens, New York, cussing and flaming and blaming, and he's like a wrecking ball, and this guy is going to take down Philistines, knock down structures, and clear a clear path for the church to do what it's got to do. He'll probably make a proclamation about Israel and Jerusalem that'll shake the whole world up. I had no idea I was prophesying to Jerusalem. I should have known he's going to prophesy something about the embassy. I said, Trump is our Cyrus. And we're coming up on the 70-year cycle. Jeremiah prophesied 70, well, 70 years for Israel. Just watch what Trump does in the Middle East when he hit that 70-year cycle. It's like, I don't know what the heck I'm talking about, but it sounds good. I said, but we better be careful because God's not sending him so we can all go make money, build our ministries, and have a revival. He's sending him so that God can get the house he wants. Evidently, we are not the house he wants. We got Lou Engel, Dutch Cheese, Jeremiah Johnson, me, meeting in focus on the family's building. We're still fragmented all over the block. We have to come together on what God wants. He wants an apostolic house that administrates the affairs of nations with authority, and there's an element of intercession. This is a house of prayer for all nations, not a house of praying for mission movements and revival. That's what we made it. It's a house administrating the affairs of nations and vetoing the activity of principalities that want to destroy the nations. That's the house God wants. And if we can start to form that governing ecclesia that can gather together as one, you might say, as one with unity amongst them, then we can start to move the perimeter out from around the house of God to the nations. We're going to rebuild the walls and the gates. Proverbs says, a city without walls is like a man without self-control, broken into and plundered. A nation that doesn't have walls is a nation that doesn't have the power to govern itself in the spirit. And if you can't govern yourself, then, then the LGBTQ, race, critical race theory, and communist Marxism will plunder you. The restoration of walls is boundaries. The definition between a man and a woman, male and female, that's a wall. It's a boundary. The moment you got all this transgender chaos, you blurred the wall. The marriage between a man and a woman, not a man and a man, a woman and a woman, and a man and three women. That wall has been, blunt, has been, has been blunted. When you've got a border where the USA is here and the world is here, but that border is broken, you end up with 25 million people coming into your country because you've got a borderless nation. Notice. Jezebel's job is to tear down borders. Ahab's job is to let her. Passivity in Republicans and witchcraft in the progressives is tearing America apart because America does not have walls because we spiritually don't build them in the body of Christ. It's all about these boundaries are being broken down. So this phase here, Nehemiah's phase. By the way, Haggai comes. With the old prophet Haggai, young prophet Zechariah, working together, tag team, boom, 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 boom. Then Zerubbabel goes, who gets that signet ring promise. He's told, build that house. So then with a remnant, it isn't everybody going to do this. Don't expect Charisma Magazine to jump on this until a year after it started. Nobody's going to lead this. It's going to be a remnant. Then everybody else will catch up with it. But this remnant anointing builds the house of God where God's presence and fire can come. Then from there, it expands into local cities, local communities. We start to rebuild walls on the school board, walls in the mayor's office, walls against crack houses. It's very, very practical. Wherever the devil is tearing down walls with his antichrist witchcraft, we're building walls of cohesion. For what purpose? A city without walls is broken into because it has no self-control. We're restoring self government in our communities by bringing God's government over the church. God's government comes to the church. The ecclesia in the church begins to move out. Now what's unique about the ecclesia is the ecclesia over here goes right into the Nehemiah chapter. Why? <laughs> well, because here's the temple of God, or you could say here's the manifest presence of God here in the church, which is characterized by walking in unity and agreement amongst various members of the body. Well, what's going on here in the wall area is out here is government. Out here is education. Out here is business. Out here is uh, media. 
in each of these separate areas is where the seven mountains comes in. All these ideas are just templates. They're mental paradigms. If you've got the body of Christ here working in what we'll call apostolic unity over here, you're not going to be able to change business unless you've got business people in the body of Christ that are occupying that gate. So you've got to gather the business leaders in the church to meet together with apostolic prophetic gatherings to empower them to go occupy the gate of commerce in the community. Does that make sense? It's as obvious as the nose on my Jewish face once you think it through. You got people in the church here and you're worried about government. Well, there's a thing called a school board. There's a county commissioner. There's, a, there's councils. There's going to be Congress people. There's legislators. What you do is you get the body of Christ to identify who are the Christians that are interested in what's happening at the gates of government. Then you inform. The ecclesia gets informed as to what the heck is going on over there. And here's the nice thing. Because of the Cyrus revelation, you don't have to only work with a fellow Pentecostal. You can work with, weirdly enough, a heathen who has the same values. Now, you won't like that at first, but that's what Winston Churchill was. That's what Abraham Lincoln was. That's what Roosevelt was. These are secular people God raises up who aren't your enemies, and you can go to war with them because they happen to believe marriage is between a man and a woman. They may not have your revelation of how to get to heaven, but they know how to get a marriage normal. I can tell this is a weird revelation for you. But that's why the ecclesia, the preachers, certain kinds of apostles and prophets get this thing flowing. Because I can work with that guy over there who's a pre-Christian because he has my same values about business or about the school or about marriage. I'll work with him, not because he preaches the same thing I preach, but because he believes the same principles I believe. And while we're walking together, I'm winning him to Jesus. Trump didn't go in there as a Christian. He got prayed a sinner's prayer at least three times. I got three evangelists I know that all made him say a sinner's prayer. I think he thinks you have to repent and ask Jesus in your heart as a normal part of a Christian experience. Does this make sense to you? This, so phase one is the house. Phase two is the walls and the gates. Gates of education. we got to get on the school boards. We did it in South Lake, Texas right now. 1,000 people went in and flooded, took over the school board, took over the, the uh, city council, took over the mayor's office. Boom. You know who it was? Christians did it. The media doesn't know it because we never said it was a church initiative. We called it a community initiative. You ever notice that in the left, they never say, hi, this is like Marxist organizing for the Democrat Party. They call it community organizing. They give it the most apple pie name they can so they can slip the arsenic in and you eat it. They don't, they don't say, hi, this is the satanic plan we have for your city. They say we call it democracy aligned. So, gates of influence is the next phase. But the house apostolically does it. Now, I know that after a certain point in time, it's like a beautiful mind. It starts to look like confusion. But somehow it all makes sense. I've had people literally... After, like, if this is the only thing I've got, and imagine this is like a piece of paper, so I can't erase it. It gets layered and layered as the meeting goes on. I've had people actually pull me aside afterward, worried about me. <laughs> Lance, are you okay? Is this, if this is evidence of what's going on in your life, do you have, do you have any place you can go to decompress? <laughs> it makes sense to me. So the prophets, prophets, and intercessors have been prophesying for America. God is not letting America go over a cliff. He gave us a Donald Trump. He gave us those, uh, the Cyrus anointing on him. And he was, for, without a doubt, to leave gates of Babylon. I can tell you story after story. Uh, the whole world was under, under the control of this unusual personality that had the anointing of God on him. And the pent-up prayers of years was on this man. President Xi comes to Mar-a-Lago. Never in the history of China does a communist go to a wealthy man's house for a meeting. They're philosophically opposed to private wealth. And yet the president of China, because China's in such an economic upheaval, comes to Mar-a-Lago to go meet the billionaire capitalist American president. You have no idea what a psychological head trip that was and how hard it was for communist China to do it. He shows up on the night that he's meeting with Donald Trump. Donald Trump shows him pictures of sarin and gas 
on the faces of children, which cause their face to be bloated, white foam coming out of their mouth. He shows them CIA pictures of civilian casualties from sarin and gas, that sarin gas that was released in Syria, and Trump, his face red like an Old Testament king, enraged, says, would you put up with that? She goes, oh, I don't think it's a good thing. Oh, exactly. Well, I've got a little press conference going on here. It was unplanned. I'm sorry about this. Because when I come back from that press conference, uh, I'm going to have to announce I'm launching 50 Tomahawk missiles, and I'm taking those blankety blanks out. But when I come back, I've got a beautiful chocolate cake. <laughs> it's my favorite chocolate cake. It's made by my own chef. We're going to have a beautiful chocolate cake. But I want you to know, I'm going to do that. And you agree with this, right? Oh, yeah, I agree with it. Okay, good. We're on the same page. I'll be back. This president of China sits down and goes, oh, my God. This is who I've got to negotiate with? There was more accomplished by God in that one moment on China. This is no Obama. This is no bumblehead Biden. This is like, an, this is like, a, well, this is like one of those Middle East kings. Uh, except he's got the biggest arsenal with the biggest bank account, and he evidently has some personal righteous issues, and if you get on his wrong side, he'll bomb you. <laughs> I'm sitting behind the scenes. You never heard that story, because the news media, through their demons, said, can you imagine Donald Trump? Is say this? Who's watching him? Who's keeping an eye on him? Oh my God! What's he doing? And then Trump does something else ingenious. After he comes back, they get the chocolate cake. North Korea is the biggest issue he's got. What does Donald Trump do? He takes a napkin out. He takes a pen. He goes, "Can you explain to me what exactly is going on with North Korea? I can't figure this out." This is ingenious. Because basically he's got to deal with the number one client state of communist China that's the greatest destabilizing threat to the United States. And China knows if Trump gets on, if he gets on the wrong side of Trump, Trump will bomb him. He just saw that before the chocolate cake. <laughs> so he's got to explain the relationship between China and North Korea in such a way not to irritate Trump like China's behind his problems with North Korea. So he goes, it's a complicated thing. Let me explain. And so through the interpreter, he's explaining, you see, we have this relationship with them, but it's kind of a parent-child, but who wants this child? I mean, they're messed up, but yeah, we have some influence, but not all the influence, and they're an economic, oh, it's a powder keg. We ourselves have to get to deal with this. Then Trump's going, hmm, hmm, okay, okay. Well, here's what I'm going to do. Now, the ingenious part of this is the American, the imbeciles in Washington are all thinking that Trump, what are you Humiliation. Why didn't he go to Mike Pence? Why didn't he go to Casey? Why didn't he go to the con his own his own consultants to talk about the complexity of communist China? Well, two reasons. Why? They've screwed up this thing all this time for the last 20 years, so Trump doesn't want to hear them because he doesn't think they know what they're talking about. <laughs> Secondly, he already knows what's going on. He has talked to people that do know what's happening. He's acting a little dumb because he wants this communist oligarch, this ruler, to come to Trump on Trump's terms to explain to him what he thinks the problem is so the two of them can look like they're working together in unity to solve it. It's ingenious. Rather than lecturing him like an Obama or an American, he says, explain to me what this is going on here. What do you think's happening here? Oh, is that how? So China goes home thinking, we have influence with this guy. I'll tell you what, he's a, he's a character, but I think I have some influence with him. That's exactly where Trump wants him to go. Because the first conversation is trade, and they're going to have to talk turkey with us. You understand what I'm talking about? What happened? We had an ingenious moment in history. I'll tell you where I think we screwed up. I'm just being honest with you. Because the church can't have any agreement on this. The problem with the body crisis is every, every tribal elder, it's just human nature. Every guy with a microphone thinks he knows more than the other guy. So there's no humble collaboration among us to find out what do you got that I don't got. Does that make sense to you? You see, and if I want to have the mind of Christ, I need the 360-degree mind of Christ. This media person here sees something I don't see over here with my church gate. I've got a certain revelation from the church, from the charismatic movement, from paradigms that I've got prophecies. I'm stewarding this. It's powerful. But I see the spiritual realm. I'm not seeing what's coming economically. I'm not seeing what's happening politically. I need to understand what's going on in media. And I need also to talk about how the heck the devil took over America's education establishment and how do we undo it. 
to have that conversation, I'm not channeling my infinite wisdom. I'm limited based on the scope of my authority at my gate. Every gate has a view of what's going on, but no one gate has a 360 degree perception. So it requires humility. That's why the key characteristic of the apostles and the prophets for this move is humility. Because it means I know what I see, but I need to know what you see so I can add what you see to what I see so I can see the whole picture. That's what we've got to pray into. Well, the problem is we had our trump, but the church did not give God the house he wanted. Lack of unity. It'll show up in, in history. We prayed in more deliverance than we tapped into. We're like the Elisha as he's dying. The king comes to him, oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel. And the wheezing prophet says, all right, all right, you need, you need me. I'll give, I'm gonna, I got some juice in me for one more, one more divine intervention for the nation. Go to the window. Go to the window. Fire an arrow through the window. King goes over, fires the arrow through the window. All right, take those uh, arrows in your hand. King grabs the arrows. Pound them on the ground. King goes. Prophet leans up on one arm and goes, oh, what is the matter with you people? You got a divine window of deliverance and you tap three times? Why didn't you smite those arrows five, six, seven times? You would have wiped out your enemy. Now you'll have a brief respite. You're not going to destroy them. That should have been the word we heard the moment Trump was inaugurated. These Christian tappers the Twitter tappers who have Twitter trauma when Trump tweets. <laughs> oh, I wish he wouldn't tweet that way. <laughs> we didn't meet the man with the full strength of an ecclesia ready to take ground. If we had, had done so, we would have had five or six years of him mowing down Philistines and tearing down their demonic idols, and then we could have occupied a stronger position when the pushback came in the seventh year. We, we may have been shocked at how much pent-up rage and opposition there was, but at least we would have occupied the high places. Right now, we're under siege, and it looks to me like we pretty much lost every executive order that came out of the pen of Trump, while the church is divided if we should even be involved with the politics. Infuriating. You can see why I'm not welcome at every conference. <laughs> hey, guy. The rebuke was, where's my house? What did God do? Sent the plague. He sent a Wuhan. And all the economy shut down. And everybody was stuck in their houses. And the prophet, 80-year-old prophet, cranky Jew, comes down. Do you know why this is happening? Because God gave you Cyrus, God gave you prosperity, and instead of building his kingdom and doing what he gave you a chance to do, all of you went and built your own enterprise, your own houses, your own mailing list, your own ministries. You didn't get together. Our biggest problem is we have no apostolic convening that has the authority, evidently, to get the body of Christ to meet in one place at one time and humbly have this conversation. Well, the reality is, we didn't give God the house. So where are we? I wrote about this in my book. You can grab my book out there. Uh, apart from the part where I'm saying praying for Trump because I'm so fixated on the necessity of trying to get him in for another four years, here's what I said. We are experiencing, this is my chapter, the stalled reformation. The stalled, remember this. Revival is the phenomena we love that happens at the local level. Woo, it's, I want the revival. It's the presence of God, the glory of God, the angels of God, the salvation of God, the manifestation of God, the healing signs, wonders, deliverance. Woo! That's not what's going to change America. Revival is interpersonal. Reformation is institutional. You have to deal with the institution of slavery so that your Charles Finney revival is going to actually change America or America will fragment in a civil war and slavery will continue. This was where Finney had to roll into in the administration of Lincoln. The revival didn't change the institutions enough. Now Wilberforce in Great Britain, they had revival. They had Whitfield and Wesley and revival impulses and power and surges in their revivals. But that translated to Wilberforce and the parliament 
changing the laws. So without a bloody revolution or civil war, they eradicated slavery. That's reformation. What you really want is reformation. If revival, which is interpersonal, doesn't become reformation, which is institutional, if the institution of government and banking and, the, and education and, and truth you know, telling and media, if these are not reformed, they can be occupied by devils. And after the winds of revival blow, what happens is the enemy comes back and Jesus warned. He said, uh, when that strong man's house is swept clean, if it isn't occupied, he comes back seven times worse. So the sweeping move of God that we love is not the solution. It's the sweeping move of God that leads to occupying the house. So when God says he's building his house, it's a house that can occupy the high places in the nation. A house that can administrate in some way over the government and over the culture and shape it. And it can't be done by force. It has to be done by persuasion. That's where media and Hollywood and academia and engagement comes from. It's the power of persuasion. Does that make sense? So here we are. Stolen Reformation right here. Can't hardly get to the walls and gates. Walls and gates is a big battle right now. But if we can, the end game is going to be sheep and goat nations. Here's the final point. What's a sheep and a goat nation? You better get this one down because this is what all the battles are about right now. When you hear about uh, the global reset, economic reset, and about the economy, which the devil looks like he's trying to tank the American economy, it's too bad because we didn't have to have this happen. We're the only, even though we got $30 trillion of debt, we're the only game in town. Money all over the world is looking for a place to go. It would like to go to Wall Street. But Wall Street, with our spending we have in government, looks like it's, uh, it's set on its own uh, self-destruction. But here's, here's what I want you to see. I want to close with this. This is real quick. This is the highway up into this thing, how we're going to see this end in a positive way. Sheep nations and goat nations are the two contending forces, the goats and the sheep. Real quick thought. Sheep are sovereign nation states. Sovereign nations versus empire. This is the deal. We're in the division between China wants an empire, global dominance. The Islam wants empire. They're caliphate driven. They want to take over other nations. Sorry to say Roman Catholic Church in its history, driven by empire. The modern nation state, America, European nation states came out in the 1500s because of a 30-year war between the Protestants and the Catholics. And people say there's more fights over religion than anything. Well, it's an interesting question there. What were they fighting for? Catholicism wanted empire. The Protestants wanted independent nation states. The independent nations won. And out of that came the United States of America. So we came out of the Protestant battle against empire. And now, when you hear the chanting of Antifa and Black Lives Matter and the activist groups funded by Steyer and Soros on the border, interesting statement when they're down there chanting to take down the wall. No borders, no walls, no USA at all. No borders, no walls. This is all the way back from Hillary's day. Think about what they're saying. No borders, no walls. Get the Nehemiah idea? No USA at all. Meaning one big global happy Woodstock which will never happen. Because the moment our borders go down, every other predator nation in the world will cannibalize us and take over. So, the end game is Jesus said, as much as you've done to these, my brethren, so you've done to me. The characteristic of sheep nations is their relationship with Jews and Christians. They will not openly, institutionally, molest, persecute, and harass the freedom of religion. The only defining issue you need to know about a nation is where does it stand with freedom of religion with Israel and with the Christians? Antichrist cannot disguise its hatred of Christ and Israel. Jesus uh, in nations is raising up nations now that are fighting and that's why the whole embassy move and the alliance of nations with Israel is so fascinating. Those are sheep nations. You wanna hear something weird? There are goat nations that are becoming sheep nations and there are sheep nations becoming goat nations. Because there are nations that actually love Christians or freedom of religion and Israel that are 
turning against Christianity. We're watching that in America. And then you've got these Saudi countries, the Abraham Accords, where they're historically against Israel, and they're actually forming peace alliances with Israel. So you're watching, God is right now going through the earth to determine the ultimate disposition of nations based on how they stand on Israel, how they stand on him. And that's the defining point. Does that make sense? So we're praying for our nation that we will be a sovereign nation, and the great issue is how does it stand in relationship to Jews and Christians? These goats in the empires, they will persecute Israel. They will persecute religious liberty. That's the defining issue. These will be antichrist. These will be for Christ. And there will be sheep nations when Jesus returns. I know that's gonna, we'll have to cover that at another time because the whole world is in the power of the evil one, the antichrist. Well, if the whole world's in the power of the antichrist, then how come he's constantly going to war? Three and a half years of him going to war. Oh, apparently he's victorious. Yeah, but apparently somebody's constantly resisting. So there is sheep nations in the last days, so you don't give up on that. The shaking has already begun. Are we agreed on that? Haggai said the shaking is starting, and I think the shaking is going to continue to shake everything Satan does, and the ultimate goal is going to be sheep cities, sheep regions, sheep nations. You've got to fight for you. You may not have influence over the country. You've got influence in your own backyard. This should be a sheep city. This is a sheep city, and it's a city where you can build your own walls. We're doing that in Texas. We're doing that in Florida. We're doing that in Alabama. Our teams, the apostolic hubs are right now getting very practical about what it is to be able to build occupation of territory. We have our own media platforms now. We're working on our own currencies, by the way, which is whole Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. We've got our own teams working on that. We have our own uh, corridor within the Republican Party because we're not going to let it go Ahab. It's going to have to stay vig vigilant. On, and we're working with Trump's, uh, Trump's team because I, I believe the Cyrus anointing is still on him. But everybody's fixated on Trump coming back, Trump coming back. The focus should be on giving God the house he wants because that's the only reason why we don't have Trump. <laughs> we're focusing on the wrong thing. All right, we'll, finally, we'll wrap it all up with this, because what's happening with Israel right now, I told the pastor last night, it's very exciting. What's happening with Israel is kind of interesting, because Netanyahu was supposed to be moved out. Israel and the United States are like parallel tracks. If you ever notice this, the Jews, USA, and Israel, it's like what happens over here with Israel and what happens with the USA, it kind of goes back and forth like that. Well, I was worried when Trump was moving out, when Trump was being overpowered by progressives on the left and by what I think is the election fraud machine and the lack of interest in exposing the corruption. That's what always amazes me at Washington and the Republicans in general, why they aren't vigilant about fighting back. It's kind of really weird. But that's Ahab. Ahab is passive. So uh, as Republicans are passive and, and the left, Democrats are Jezebel. That's witchcraft. Intimidation, manipulation, domination, and control. So when you have intimidation and control and comes up against passivity, passivity ugh, shrugs its shoulders and intimidation takes territory. That's the story you've had with 30 years of Washington. So the, uh, until Trump came along. So now the, uh, what happened with Netanyahu was he was going out following Trump, uh, just a global trend. This way, Bolsonaro, I'll be meeting with him. He's a Cyrus. Cyruses are a type, not people. Cyrus is, isn't just Donald Trump. It's Bolsonaro. It's Viktor Orban. It's the president of Poland. Uh, so you've got to look for the Cyrus types. By the way, the Cyrus types are all aligned with sheep nation values. So there's a fascinating alignment here. Cyruses produce sheep nations, and they align with Israel and religious liberty. Cyruses have apostolic leaders that talk to them, and they listen to them because apostolic leaders have a signet ring anointing to impress these secular leaders with wise counsel that for some reason these leaders can hear wise counsel. Anytime Trump was given wise counsel, he acted on it. So Israel was tottering because Netanyahu was on his way out. He couldn't get unity in his government. So the, uh, the, uh, they, were, they were looking for a, a liberal and a midpoint conservative, and they were going to put them, and they were having an election. Hamas decided to attack Israel during the removal of Netanyahu. This is what you got to see that the news will never catch. Not even one American news. They don't get this. Hamas picked the wrong time to attack it says, so God says, what you're doing is evil. But if you do it at the wrong time, it'll work against you and not prosper. So here's what they did. Hamas decided they were going to attack 
to, and they were going to undermine Netanyahu, and they were going to thump their chest and make themselves look stronger. So with their elections, rather than Abbas getting in, they would be able to have Hamas take over the Palestinians. So they had two things they're going to do. Destabilize their own president and move up politically, and do it by punching Israel at a time when Netanyahu is already weak, and now's a good time for us to get votes in our election and seal Netanyahu's fate. But they made a miscalculation. Because the one thing about Jews is they can't agree on anything. They don't agree on orthodox, they don't agree on gays, they don't agree on economics, they don't agree. The only thing they agree on is their own survival and the military non-neutrality they have against any nation that attacks Israel. Because they, no one can get elected unless they're vigilant about Israel's military independence. So when they were attacked, Netanyahu went from being the guy they were getting rid of to the only leader they had that they could align with until the next election. So they put the election to the side for their own survival. They all lined up under Netanyahu. And Bibi Netanyahu is anointed for war. He is a Cyrus ruler. So the moment that they have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 rockets, it's not good. Rockets are coming in. So Netanyahu puts the word out. First thing he does is they pinpoint all of the locations where they know the Hamas infrastructure is, and boom, they start taking it out. Find out that the Hamas building, corporate headquarters, is the same place where the Associated Press has their headquarters. Can you imagine the Associated Press is actually down the hall from a terrorist organization? What does that tell you about the media under the control of the devil and uh, Hamas, a terrorist organization? So Netanyahu tells them, look, I don't want to make any enemies tomorrow. Get out of the building. I'm taking it out. So the Associated Press gets out. Boom, he knocks the building down, they, and, they, and they show it. Now, he's starting to signal he's going to go after specific targeted infrastructure. And then he puts the word out, which is very mischievous. The Jewish people did a very mischievous thing. They told all the fake news media a fake story. You should never tell a lie or a lie because it's not ethical. So they told the fake news. We're going to be amassing for a great ground invasion. That way we can limit the casualties and we can take Hamas out of its nesting in the Golan Heights, in the, in, in the, uh, in the area where they're attacking from. So here we go. The, uh, the, the, uh, the rumor's out that there's going to be a vast mobilization of military infantry. So they're ready for it. And what are they going to do? They dug nine miles of highway tunnels underneath the ground so that they can pop up, they can move around. When you come here, they're gonna show up over here and they got a whole infrastructure of an underground city where they can move their troops. So if you show up here, they could fight you over here. They're ready for this. Also, before the ground assault, before they go in, Netanyahu releases an artillery bombardment. Boom, 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 to soften up the, you know, the infantry. So they're, they know now, okay, the infantry, the infantry is being bombed, go to the tunnels, because we're not going to have any casualties, because they're coming in. But Netanyahu had no intention of sending any soldiers in. You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to get Hamas into the tunnels, because the number one problem they got is civilian casualties. So the challenge is how to separate Hamas from the civilians, because Hamas likes civilian casualties. The media covers it and creates sympathy for uh, Arabs. You got how the story works? So Hamas, so Hamas is told he's coming with infantry, and then the artillery bombardment will precede it. Well, the artillery bombardment happened, but there was no infantry. You know what came after that? Donald Trump's bombs. Obama would not give Netanyahu bunker-busting bombs, because bunker-busting bombs can go all the way down to the tunnels. Trump gave Israel the bunker-busting bombs. So Netanyahu flew knowing exactly where the tunnels were. He flew and bombed and collapsed nine miles of tunnels. Nine miles of infrastructure. Suddenly the news cycle, peace, fire, peace, fire, peace. peace. They want to peace, they want to, put, want to have a ceasefire, ceasefire, peace, ceasefire and peace. Why? Because the PLO let the message go that this was a crippling retaliation that took out not only a significant number of their soldiers, it collapsed their infrastructure underground. Now, why is that? Now, what's the spiritual lesson? Netanyahu ends up becoming, at this point, rallied behind by the whole nation, which is reluctant to move him out. At the time they were going to get rid of him, he's got more support than he ever had before. He has the unity because the enemy attacked him at the wrong time. But the enemy attacked him utilizing underground infrastructure that they had been, they had been building that they denied existed. And here's the parallel that I think happens. Haman got hung on his own gallows 
and Hamas got buried in their own tunnels. Netanyahu is the Cyrus ruler who was on the ropes getting taken out, but the moment that the enemy's attack was exposed and the underground was revealed, it took out the enemy's power and credibility globally, and it took out their ability to fight locally. It could be that what's happening now in that moment right there is that uh, Trump, who himself is like a Netanyahu, uh, who, is, who is already out of power, that it could be that what the enemy has done in their underground way, and I think the underground is the election fraud, I think if these underground tunnels are exposed, it's going to expose everyone who was involved with it, and it's possible that these, this whole thing could collapse and kill the credibility of the entire Democratic agenda for the next two years. I think that's possible. Because I, don't, because I think that uh, the underground has to be exposed, and the moment it's exposed, everyone associated with it is ex is, has lost their uh, credibility with it. Make sense? So my word to you is that history is unfolding right now, but I pray desperately, and, I, and this is why I wanted to meet with Pastor uh, Tim, I pray that there's going to be an alliance of apostolic and prophetic leaders that will become an ecclesia, giving God the house that he wants that we will gather with us the apostles that understand and work within government, within media, within business, that we develop a 360-degree net that isn't just driven by the Internet, but is driven really by very powerful alliances that are going to be able to go into the local areas and the, and the fields, the midterms, wherever the enemy gathers, where we can lock our shields, form a 360 degree protection around what God wants to do, and then access the unique manifestation of the, uh, of the wisdom of God for that battle. Remember, this many faceted is the key word there, the many faceted glory of God that now the principalities and powers might be revealed, the manifold wisdom of God. The word manifold means many facets of a diamond. There's a facet that needs to be captured in each battle, and there's no one size fits all. That's how Jesus gets the glory. The battle that you have here is different than the battle that they have in another place. Same enemy, but it's a different tactic is going to prevail. Does that make sense? The, re the person you run for office, the people that you put in there are not going to be the same people as my people. Your people have to be, though, the right people to be able to push back in each of these gates. And so I'm praying for this right now. Father, I thank you that there is a, an anointing for the for the bunker-busting anointing to take out the underground spiritual tunneling that has been working, Lord, to erode our nation's culture, to erode our children, to erode the education, to erode our economy. Lord, you're seeing the enemy's infrastructure, the invisible works of darkness. But Lord, we just lift our eyes towards you. And we are praying, Father, that you are going to enlighten our understanding, that we would know how to advance the kingdom of God in our day, how to advance your purpose and agenda in our cities and in our nation. Lord, there's a battle in government. There's a battle in media. There's a battle in the war of words that is, uh, that is trying to persuade and take over and captivate the minds of nations. But I pray for that Elijah anointing that will overturn the false prophets of Baal, that will put Jezebel and that spirit back, that will be a Jehu anointing that will work within the government structures to be able to cast out of the windows, Lord, the works of darkness. I pray for the exposing, Lord God, of what is working against your plans and your purposes. I pray, Lord, for a unifying of the body of Christ. The silver is yours, the gold is yours, and you will fill this house with glory. Lord, help us to be the house you fill. Help us to join stone to stone, ligament to ligament, sinew to sinew. Let this body get shaken and rise up. And, oh, God, give us ears to hear what the Spirit says. And a great mouth, oh, a great mouth of utterance, the ecclesia, the church of God, the mouth of God, the signet ring of God, sealing the utterance of heaven into the hearts and minds of nations. Oh, in Jesus' name. Pastor, pastor, please take over. I believe the Lord's doing this now. I believe the Lord is doing this now. 
You that said as one, and you said it with all your heart, you've got to understand something. Your life is not your own. And the great enemy you've got, I'm sorry to say, is familiarity with yourself. You do not really know who you are or what you're capable of. One of the fun things about my life is I get into places and I don't know what I'm doing there. I know I don't know what I'm doing there. And I say to the Lord all the time, I got to meet with this president. I got to meet with this head of state. I say, How, who set this up? What am I doing talking? What, do you want my, what am I supposed to say? And the Lord says, it's not important that you know what to say. It's important that you act like you know what to say. Think about that. That'll, that'll humble you and keep you on your toes. It's not important that you know what you're doing. It's important that you act like you know what you're doing. Because evidently those people think you know what you're doing. So I said, what do I do? The Lord says, in that moment, I will give to you what you need to know and what you need to say. Be faithful to say nothing less and nothing more than what I tell you to say. And that's the moment that signet ring kicks in and, and literally things get set in motion by just a few sentences. But it's a humble and kind of a tightrope. I pray this for every one of you because all of you are kind of comfortable in your little world. You've already defined what you can do. You have no idea how dangerous it is to answer the call of God. He will take you well beyond what you think you can do and you'll have no excuse because you'll know that, uh, that it's going to require of you total faith to do what God's asking you to do. But you're going to have to answer it, answer for the call of God. And he's going to take you places you don't know. He's going to take you well beyond your comfort zone. Are you willing to do that? I don't know why God should keep us around here if we're not willing to do. I remember one time I went to a meeting in Detroit. It was kind of a frustrating meeting. Kim Clement and I were going to introduce the prophetic. We were going to introduce the prophetic right after a lady got up, and her great testimony was that she had been in that church for 20 years, and she shared all the prophecies and how God had moved in such a powerful way in all his prophecies. And then she died the week before we got there to do our great prophetic conference, pioneered by a woman who opened up the church because she had all these prophetic testimonies that the church knew about. And I'll never forget, thank God, Bill Hammond got him just a week before us. And he said, I hear Sister so-and-so got up here and she held up her binder full of prophecies and gave word after word about how God miraculously answered her prayers over those 25 years in intercessor. And then she died. And some of you are a little discouraged and confused. But to me, it makes total sense. Do you remember what she said? She said that the Lord God in her lifetime had fulfilled every promise of prophecy that she had ever received and went down every one of them. He said, once your prophecies are all done, there's no more guarantee you're needed here. So thank God for your unfinished prophecies. I never forgot that. I started making inventory of every prophecy I got that wasn't done yet. I said, Lord, we're not done yet. We haven't seen this. We haven't seen that yet. I'm not complaining. I'm happy. I'm happy it didn't happen. But let's go. we got to get these things happening. So I'm praying for you right now. I'm praying for you that God's going to give you some... Uh, new prophetic assignments and, and that uh, you're going to find some new challenges and trust me God's going to take you places that you're not comfortable going but don't let that be a reason you don't go there that very well could be the reason why he sent you there because you have no background in that and therefore you're going to be totally open to the radical thing God wants to do like Donald Trump in politics in Jesus name amen <laughs> Uh. Man. <laughs> I think I'm going to live to a hundred at least. Wow. Um, I'm glad that we have some that are part of our tribe that are willing to say, declare the truth. We need Dr. Lance doing what he's doing and others like him. I thank, I'm so thankful that Holy Spirit has positioned him for such a time as this. Pray for this man. You know, pray that God will continue to connect and promote him.